For past few months, brethren, the Lord has laid a, a message on my heart which I have the opportunity to share with you today. While we are going through the theme of grace, this is not specifically about grace, but grace is a huge part of what we're going to talk about today. The topic is the Ministry of Reconciliation. The Ministry of Reconciliation. Every now and again in our journey with Christ, we need to reflect on the reason why we are where we are with Christ. Why we have committed our lives and where are we going. And I find from time to time that when we look at what God is doing through His Son and through us, it's a constant amazement and motivation for me. The walk that we are in is not to be taken lightly. Too many things have been fulfilled that were ordained from the foundation of the world, as the Bible put it. So it's a huge plan that God made that has been unveiled year by year, century by century. And we are at a point where there is even more, much more to come. But the whole plan is a beautiful one. So I'm going to start by looking at the, the main passage, which is uh, 2 Corinthians 5. And we will see what Paul has to say about this ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. All things are of God. God hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. So the first question is, who is us? Who has God given the ministry of reconciliation? Is it confined only to the apostles? Or is it to all those who come in through Christ? As we go through the scriptures, we'll be able to answer this question for ourselves. Because the Holy Spirit is at work. And there's a great, even greater work to be done in these tough times. So we need to just get back to the right motivation for what we are doing and what we have to do. Now, let's look at how Paul builds his argument. Always an interesting writer, Paul. So here he's saying from, from verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our, our house which is from heaven. If so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
a beautiful picture painted there. Because Paul is recognizing that while we are in the flesh, while we are in this body, we are still mortals. And he has a longing to be clothed upon, or to, to be clothed by immortality, life. That's a great hope in itself. The present body that we occupy is temporary. But he's also saying here that God has given us something, and it's a great comfort. God didn't just give us a promise of eternal life, but he has given us the earnest. And when I looked and realized what an earnest is, it is even far more assuring. We are accustomed to people making promises and breaking them. But the earnest is something that is more tangible. You want a house, for example, and you tell somebody, I'm going to buy this house, and they say, okay, this house costs a million dollars, you have to give me 10%. And you come up with your $100,000 and give to that person. That is far more than a promise. That is what an earnest is. It's actually holding on to a piece of that which you shall have. So when Paul contemplates life, mortality, he's saying that God has given us a touch of what we shall be in the future. He has given us the spirit, the earnest of the spirit. So what we have abiding in us today is that just a portion of what we shall be when we are clothed upon with immortality. And that word, word makes a lot of sense to me, especially with the recent experience of my sister's passing. Because what is this life? After we live our best, and we do all the good, and people have a lot of good things to say about us. But then comes the day when we are lying in the cold. And then nothing makes sense to anyone, except the fact that it is really not the end. That hereafter, God will clothe his people with a new body, a new tabernacle. This is the real hope that the world need to see. So Paul says in verse 5, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be the good or the bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again to you, but you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that we may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and in the heart. We walk by faith, not by sight. Reconciliation is what Paul is aiming at as we go through this passage. And the Easterns Bible Dictionary define it as a change from enmity to friendship. It is a mutual, that is, it is a change wrought in both parties who have been at enmity. So, if there is a ministry of reconciliation, there has to be two parties that are at enmity. Which parties are we talking about here 
that are against each other and need to be reconciled. John 7.7 7 gives us an idea and I'm going to look at a number of scriptures by John because he seemed to have had a good grip of the parties. John 7.7 7 says, The world cannot hate you, but it hate me. But me it hated, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. The world hateth Christ because Christ tell the world that the works are evil. John 15, 18 If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hate you. Enmity exists. So there, there's odds between Christ and his Father, they are one, and the world which he does not recognize, appreciate, or serve the Christ. So there is enmity between the world and God. Let's read some more of John. John 15:19. If he were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Mm. So there is enmity. When we see a day like today, it is clear as to who we belong to. We are here because we love the Lord. The world will maybe call some of us, some of our relatives who don't understand will say, are you crazy to be going out in this weather to serve your Lord? No way. Church would be a no-no for me today. But you know something, for something else important to them in worldly affairs, they would go through snow ten times as thick as this one because that's where the heart is. So there's a contrast. You know, uh, Paul said, if he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. And that's the, the huge difference with us and the people who don't recognize the Lord. We seek the things that are above. The things which speak to eternal life. The things which speak to being like the Lord. The things which make us become, in, become the best we can as human beings. It is about the fruit of the Spirit. It is about denying the flesh. It is about rejoicing in the Lord always. All these wonderful things. The world cannot understand it. There is enmity. James 4.4 4. Listen to what James says now. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So this is a very, you know, serious and forward statement. Jesus himself said, just to repeat that, the world hates him because what? He points out their evil works. In the same way, if we don't point out evil in this world, we may be friends with them. But the moment we start to point out the evil, we're not going to be friends with the world. And so we always have that choice. Are we going to point out evil? Because I think that an important part of the reconciliation of anyone to Christ and to God 
is that evil has to be pointed out. How can you reconcile unless there is confession? How can you have reconciliation unless there is acknowledgement that a party has done wrong? First John 2 15. Just to point out the, the, where the enmity lies. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The things of the world and the world are really not for us. We enjoy a lot of things in this world, and we have the right to. We have the right to the best of any material thing that God bless us with. The moment though that we start to put those things above the Lord and His will, that is where we cross the line. And we are no more of God, but we are of the world. It doesn't matter what I own. It doesn't matter what I, I have. All those things must be secondary to my faith and my walk with Christ. They should not impede my walk. So God can bless you with the best of everything. But we're not talking about whether you're rich or not. It's where your heart is. If we find that the things of this world matters more than the things of the kingdom, then you know that you are on the side of the world. You are loving the world and the things of the world. But when the things of the world are just mere convenience and for comfort, but your heart really is in the right place, then we have a good relationship with Christ. Let's see some more. First John 2.16 For all that is in the world is the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, which is not of the Father, but of the world. We just read that. And First John 2.17 And the world passeth away, and the loss thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, as we walk the walk with Christ, we must be cognizant of the fact that the world really is not our friend because it's not God's friend. The world really is, God, is, 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 a, is at enmity with God. And not only at enmity with God, but God is not happy when the world is at that state of enmity with Him because He is a God of love. And that brings us to the question as to having established the fact that the world is at enmity with God. How do we go about reconciling? Or how do we participate in the ministry of reconciliation? What is it that we need to do? And most importantly what I want to address is what will motivate us to help people that we know in the world to come to the knowledge of Christ, to accept His will and to do His will. To change from a position of hostility towards God and His plan to a place of fellowship and cooperation and obedience to God's will. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5.10. And this is one thing that Paul points out that motivates him and should motivate us. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad.
So that's the first thing that will motivate us is that every human being must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Do we believe this? It means our friends and our relatives who are not in obedience with Christ now will have to give an account of their lives before the judgment seat of Christ. To what extent, therefore, is our love for them? To what extent are we concerned about the reality of life, the bigger picture of life, that we would reach out and let them know that, look, take this thing into consideration as they go about your life. What you must take in consideration is that one day you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. None can escape. What? How will you account for your life? What would you say? What excuse will you have? If we are to participate in this ministry of reconciliation, we must consider those who are in the world at enmity with God because they are not obeying God and be motivated by this. But it goes a little bit deeper than just knowing that we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Because Paul says in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. We must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But also, we who are sitting here, we know the terror of the Lord. It's easy for us to be people to be caught up in all the affairs of the world and forget about God. That's not hard. When, when, when you look at what's going on in social media, all the things that people have to grab their attention, you can easily just float along with all that is going on and forget about your accountability to your God. So the church is here for a reason. And our weekly gathering is here for a reason. That we remind ourselves so that we can remind others on the outside of their responsibility for their own lives. Let's quickly review the, what Paul may be speaking about when he says knowing the terror of the Lord. Now we know in the Genesis 13, I think it's Genesis 13, 13. There was a city that is described as evil, exceedingly evil. You remember that city? Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Genesis 19, it is said that God rained down fire and brimstone on that evil city. If you remember the story, Abraham was actually negotiating with God to save the city. And he says, Lord, if there are 50 people, save them. God who knows everything says, I can't find 50 righteous. And I think he went down to 10. No, I can't find 10. If there are 5, save the city. I can't find 5. And God did reveal his wrath on that city and rained down fire and brimstone. It's a rem something that we must bear in mind that God actually acts on his word. 
those who do not obey God shall pay the price and it's a heavy price Exodus 12:12. 12, 12. Another scenario where God's terror uh, was executed. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts, and against all the gates of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. When God is ready to act, He acts. And so we find that Pharaoh stood up stubbornly against God's plan, God's will against Moses and Aaron. But there comes a time when God says, okay, I will give you what you can't bear anymore. And so, he slew all the firstborn. In other words, God is teaching mankind a lesson. Let's not play with God. Because the time will come when he will execute judgment. And there is even more to come. In Matthew 3, 7, we have John the Baptist preaching. And he was preaching the message of repentance. It's another effort to, for the reconciliation of, of, of the world to God. But here, Matthew 3, 7, it's about when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So I see here that John the Baptist recognized that those who came for baptism realized that there was an impending judgment. And he was questioning, who hath warned you? They were doing the right thing. They were fleeing from the wrath to come. And I think we need to take a cue from John the Baptist and ask people to flee from the wrath to come. And that brings me to Revelation 15.1, talking about the wrath to come is real. Revelation 15.1 And I saw another angel, and I, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Great ideologies have survived centuries and even millennia. Mankind have experimented with governments and have failed. Many systems they have tried to put in place but they cannot maintain peace in this world up to this day. We have more wars and conflicts and confusion than ever before it seemed. Because mankind has proven to be incapable of bringing about that utopian society that has been sought after by many great men and women. But while the world continues against God, while people just live as if there is no God. Every act of sin done against God is recorded. Sin does not go unpunished and will not go unpunished. People are taking breaking the commandments for granted.
stores are opening up in the Sabbath. Workplaces, you can hardly find a business that is not running on the Sabbath these days because the world is just looking at its thing, the things down here. And the focus on eternal things are getting dimmer and dimmer. It, it, it does provide serious challenges for those of us who have seen the light and who are the light of this world. It does seem as if the gap between sin and righteousness is widening so much because the average person these days does not really talk about God. And what's happening is that many believers whose affection should be set on things above, just to, to cope with, with your environment, you find that you will rather compromise and talk about the, the movie stars and the latest movie and the, the sports and everything that's going on in the world and leave out the eternal things that matters, like the judgment and the coming of Christ and the wrath to come. And all those things. Because those arguments seem to be too high flown for the average worldly person. You walk through Toronto and you see all the entertainment and the, 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 all the freedom that is given by the human rights. And you wonder if people recognize that there's a God watching. Sin is being committed in our very eyes, in our very faces, in our ears, it's all around us and it's getting worse. So when I look into the Ministry of Reconciliation, a world that is so bad, a world that is rotten in immorality, the stench of the sin certainly is going up to the nostril of God. Very little recognition of truth, even among so-called Christians. People are pursuing their religion for their own purposes, their own reasons it seems, and not just focusing on what God wants them to, to do and getting in obedience to truth. So there is enmity. Enmity. So brethren, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade men. Are we willing to attempt to persuade men knowing the terror of the Lord? I'm suggesting that we take this seriously. Knowing the terror of the Lord, what do we do? We persuade men. The message of judgment doesn't fit nicely into an intelligent, intellectual society. Sounds too hard and backward, maybe, I don't know. But it's real. But Paul has another motive for spreading the word of God and, and, and for persuading men. And let's look at uh, the same book, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For the love of God constraineth us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for those, died for them and rose again. So in addition to knowing the terror of the Lord, Paul is saying, the love of God 
constrains him. And the love of God is demonstrated in this. If one died for all, then we're all dead. And it reminds me of what Paul writes in Ephesians, that ye were dead in your trespasses and sin. So out of love, God sent his son to die for all. So all were dead. But I like this part, and Paul keeps making this point over and over, and I'm not sure how many of us get it. But he's saying that, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So those of us who accept the Lord in our hearts as our Savior, we should not live for ourselves anymore. But we should live for Christ. Now, we love autonomy. We love to be our own bosses. But when it comes to Christ and the love of God which constrain us, we have to give up some of our autonomy of our lives. We have to. The love of God is so powerful and demonstrated so well that it has the ability to actually hold us in place. It constrains us. It constrains me. That song that says, Oh love that will not let me go. What is that writer saying? If love is not letting you go, love is actually constraining you. I give my life to thee. I give all that I owe back to you. Out of love and being constrained by the love of God, which whenever I read what God has done for us, I moved. Moved so much to the point of making the necessary sacrifices just to be in line with what? With the word of God. It may mean losing some friends, right? It may mean losing some opportunity to, to, to make good money. It can mean anything. It depends on what God asks you to do. But when you have the love of God constraining you, you want to live for Him with all that you have. So church is not just a place that you come to wander about and to you know, have good fellowship and just go home and think that because your name is on the register that when Christ comes, you will be saved. It's, it's, it's far more than that. It's about you turning your life over. Paul says in, a, in, in another passage uh, in Galatians that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So the love of God constrains us. It hold us to that point and hold us to accountability that if God could send his son to die for all we also should do our part in this ministry of reconciling those who are hostile to God to come into harmony with God's will because God has given us a ministry of reconciliation is it making sense? As we have been on the topic of grace, I want to suggest that that's the, the third motivation that will lead us into putting in place in our lives the work of reconciliation. 
And let's read from Galatians 5, verse 18, where Paul mentioned the ministry of reconciliation again. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Second Corinthians five nineteen. Sorry, I think I'm, I I probably have read the, the wrong verse there, but that was Second Corinthians five eighteen. Now I'm going to read nineteen. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We went through that. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to Christ. So not only should we recognize our own reconciliation to God, but he has made us ambassadors. But that is making even more sense now. That we have been reconciled. As I'm, I'm appealing that we reach out to those who are at enmity and have them make the necessary move for reconciliation. So Paul is making the appeal for the brethren to make sure that they themselves are fully reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And I think this is where grace comes in. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he actually sent his son who knew no sin and made him sin for us. Isn't that favor? A sinless. I mean, when we do a little act that is embarrassing, we, 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 we want to stay away from people and we don't even want anyone to see us if they know what we did. Can be so embarrassing. Sin. You know, certain acts, certain thoughts, certain lifestyle. And when someone who is pure, no sin, to take all of these embarrassing situations or sins on him, so that we can have deliverance from our sins. That is what I call God's favor. Do we really appreciate what God has done for us, brethren? Do we truly appreciate Him removing the scars of sin from our lives? I know what life was like for me before I committed my life to the Lord. Every sin committed was an embarrassment. But when you come to Christ and commit yourself to Him, ask that all sins be forgiven. It's a sense and a feeling of purity that I'd never experienced before. I remember lying down on the bed of the baptism and said, Lord, you can come now. <laughs> because I felt so clean, so ready, so good. It's nice to be clean, right? It's good. Satan traps us from time to time and we fall and we do something wrong, but we come back to Christ and he, he keeps us clean. But what Paul is saying is that Christ, the Son of God, had no sin, became sin for us. That we can be freed from sin. Praise his wonderful name. So Romans 5.10. Now we get to Romans. For if when we were enemies. Talking about the enmity. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. And not only so. 
But we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. It is all about giving God the praise, the recognition, and acknowledging that we have been reconciled through Jesus Christ. Oh, love that will not let us go. It is so strong, it is so powerful. And you know something, when it exists among us, it binds us so tightly together that we are experiencing not just the love above, but also the love among our one another. That's how God wants it to be. All through the work of reconciliation, Jesus paid the price. We receive the reconciliation and by his life we know we shall be saved. Verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin enter into the world, and death by sin, and so death pass upon all men, for all have sinned. Again, it is not choosing who to save. It is not categorizing. It is knowing that God sent his son to die for all. And it is his plan that all come to him. Cut out their evil works and be reconciled to God. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigneth from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So Paul is recognizing here clearly as we think of grace. Through one man sin, sin entered the world. But also, by God's grace, and by the gift of grace, by one man Jesus Christ, life hath abounded to many. Life is a serious venture. We didn't ask to be here. We didn't plan our own existence. God did it all for us. He gave us physical life. And he wants to have eternal life given to his children, to all those whom, to the world who is at enmity with him. Knowing all that we know, brethren, we are being asked to participate in a ministry. A ministry of reconciling ordinary good people, or bad people for that matter, wherever, wherever you be. But just to let people know that if their works put them at enmity with God, then they need to be reconciled with God. Have that heart to heart talk with those whom you love and care for. Because one, we know the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. We are constrained by his love. And we fully recognize his grace. God bless you.